You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 206. This is our sixth and last episode on the Russian Civil War, and it will be almost entirely focused on the events that occurred after the defeat of General Denikin in late 1919, which was mostly the end of the White Threat. Throughout 1920, Communist Russia would move towards peace, with peace treaties signed with many countries that it had previously been at war with. On February 2, 1920, the Treaty of Tartu would be signed with Estonia. On July 12, the Treaty of Moscow with Lithuania. On October 11, the Treaty of Riga with Latvia. And on October 14, the Treaty of Tartu with Finland. Now, while these peace treaties represented sort of a retreat from the goal of global revolution, it did not represent all of the countries that Soviet Russia was at war with during this period. It did mark an important turning point, though. It would mark the point where the communists would, for the first time, begin to enjoy secure borders for much of their territory. This security allowed them to refocus their energies on internal issues and on the economic problems that were building up due to the stresses placed upon the country by the Civil War. In the Russian Civil War, 1916-1926, ten years that shook the world, Jonathan D. Smeal would say of this period that, quote, Lenin's regime faced persistent internal challenges to its government's governance, armed and unarmed, martial and ideological, as well as economic, in principle and in practice. However, these challenges remained largely isolated from one another, and importantly, were never so extensive as to replicate the no-go partisan-infested regions that spread like a typhus rash across the white areas in Ukraine, southern Russia, and especially in Siberia." End quote. It will be those internal challenges that we will that will occupy the first half of this episode. The answers that were found for the challenges would then go on to shape not just the immediate post-war years, but also the entire course of Soviet Russia. While many of the conflicts that Russia was involved in would officially end in 1920, by the end of 1919 it was clear that the white threat was receding and the communists would be victorious in the civil war. However, the military successes, with Kolchak and Denikin defeated, would not solve some of the economic problems that Russia had been experiencing since the First World War. The crisis of the Civil War had caused war communism to be expanded and for civilian industries and labor to be militarized. This had been a useful expedient to get through the period of greatest threat, but it was not a long-term solution. Even those workers who supported the measures, at least initially, began to reject them during 1920. The problem that would be faced by the party is that they did not necessarily have a better answer. There were two options available, though. They could either crack down harder on any person who disobeyed any directives, or they could give up. Cracking down was not really possible given the limits of communist control, and if they were not strong enough, then further repression would just cause greater problems. The other option was to give in, or to loosen controls and let the country move closer towards the dreaded C-word, capitalism. 
This would eventually be the answer, but in 1919 the communists were not yet willing to consider it. It seems only appropriate that here, in the last episode of our series about the Russian Civil War and the 12th covering the revolutions and the Civil War combined, we have to talk about food. Food had been the cause of the revolutions in 1917, and it was still a problem for the communists well into 1920. Undernourishment was rampant in Russia in 1919 and 1920, and this caused disease to spread through the population, which also reduced their ability to work. It also, in general, reduced overall happiness. The winter of 1919 and 1920 were the worst, and in the cities, the public food kitchens and bread lines sometimes failed to provide any food at all. There was also there was only one group in Russia that did have enough food, at least according to many workers and peasants, and that was the members of the Communist Party. I'm not entirely certain that this was actually the case or what the differences in rations were. There are several first-hand accounts that, of Communist Party members getting better food rations, but often they are from critics of the party, which makes it hard to know if the accounts have been embellished. But as was so often the case, the precise truth was not as important to those living at the time, and the discontent of the peasants and factory workers would grow due to their belief that they were not living in a classless society like they had been promised, but one where there were clear delineations between the upper and lower classes, and they were on the lower end. The problems with the peasants in the countryside had started almost as soon as the communists had gained control after the revolution and began to spread their influence outside of the cities. The problems would then continue throughout the entire course of white resistance, and then afterwards as well. The peasants had supported the February Revolution, and then had even supported the Bolsheviks in some cases in the October Revolution. This support was due to the belief by the peasants that both revolutions would result in more equitable land redistribution. During the period between the revolutions, they gained some autonomy, with many areas seeing peasant revolts against local landowners and elites, and then redistribution of that land among the peasants. The hope was that the Bolsheviks would continue this trend, maybe even taking it further. However, during 1918, it became clear that something very different was going to happen under war communism. Instead of taking large landowners and redistributing their land to a bunch of former peasants, the communists would force the peasants to work the land, and then they were expected to hand over any surplus items to the state. These requisition policies caused peasant resistance to ebb and flow throughout 1918 and 1919, with the severity depending at least somewhat on the ability of the Communist Party to actually enforce their requisition demands in specific areas. One delegate at the party conference uh, near the end of 1919 would say that, quote, "...peasants identify communists as people with rifles, who come to take away a cow and a horse, who come to confiscate their property." From here stems the hatred, end quote. And I think that does a pretty accurate job of telling about the views of the peasants. They believed that they had gained their freedom after the February Revolution, and then the communists came and took that freedom away from them. This freedom was taken from them through requisitions, which were poorly managed and administered, which just made the entire system even worse. The lack of organization made the requisitions feel arbitrary and random, with some areas being requisitioned multiple times and others very rarely. All of the problems that the communists had were just amplified in the areas where the whites had been in control for a lengthy period. In these areas like the Ukraine or Don or Kuban or Siberia, the communist control apparatus was relatively weak. They were forced to start from scratch in many of these areas, and they reverted back to their older strategies. This meant dividing the peasants by class as much as possible, and then working with the poorer peasants against the richer ones. The lack of power in these regions meant that they often had to resort to using the Red Army as the stick instead of a carrot, with the army being called in to use violence to make resistant peasant groups cooperate. Just to be clear here, when I say that there was violence, it was not just a small bit here or there. While the numbers are all over the place, some estimates put the total number of peasants killed in places like Ukraine, uh, Kuban, Don, and the Siberia regions in the millions. This was due both to direct violence by the communist groups and the Red Army, and due to the harshness of the requisitions that were executed on them which caused famine and other hardships. Throughout 1918 and 1919, this caused the constant simmering of tensions which flared up from time to time in fighting, 
1920, this fighting would reach new levels as tensions boiled over. Even in the areas where the violence against peasants was at its height, it was often not applied evenly. It was also, more often than not, applied in a ham-fisted and incompetent way. This inability of the communist leaders to properly handle small-scale peasant revolts would hurt both the communists and the peasants as well. It inflamed many situations which may have been containable. When the communist response did not work as expected, more peasants would get involved, and small revolts would turn into full-scale rebellions. Once these rebellions grew to a certain point, the Red Army, for all of its strength against traditional opponents, could only resort to mass violence. The peasant groups had an advantage. They were often fighting in areas around their own villages, where they could count on the support of the people. This is why the revolts by the peasants, which were called the Green Movement, and even though the Red Army was the strongest military force in Russia, trying to protect its power over the entire countryside, a hostile countryside, and Russia's pretty big, was still an incredible challenge. When waging a guerrilla war, it did not matter that the Greens were spread out, poorly supplied, disorganized. There were large numbers of them, and they were all fighting for roughly the same thing. One of their slogans was Soviet power without the communists which signified their belief that Russia should return to that period of Soviet and socialist power that it had enjoyed during the provisional government. Unfortunately for the Greens, some of the movement's strengths, with decentralization first among them, were also weaknesses. They could not overthrow the communists. They were not organized or strong enough. All they could do was actively resist communist policies, and through this resistance, attempt to force the communists to enact changes. This resistance was very costly. The Red Army moved into the areas of strong green presence and answered that presence with more and ever escalating violence, which was costly to both sides. The disorder in the countryside would have been just one piece of the unrest that would occur throughout the entire country, disorder that would eventually lead to drastic changes in communist policy. It would take a few more instances of protests and violence before these changes would take place, and those changes would only come after the leaders realized that even though they had won the Civil War, they could not make the economy work the way that they wanted. The catalyst for those changes would be rioting in the cities, which would begin in the spring of 1921. Throughout the early months of that year, overall unhappiness in the larger cities of northern Russia grew. These were areas where communist strength should have been the strongest, cities like Moscow and Petrograd, where the October Revolution had started. However, it was also these areas that had a history of revolutionary movements, and they would soon try to once again revolt, only this time against the communists. In February, thousands of workers went on strike in Moscow, and a few days later, a march was organized which would see 10,000 workers move through the city center. They were protesting against the rations that were being provided with that they were being provided with by the government. A month later, the bread a month earlier, the bread ration had been cut to just 1,000 calories for workers in the factories, barely enough to live on. They called for an end to the privileged rations for members of the party, but also critically the removal of all restrictions on free trade and movement within Russia. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. 
Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. The revolt of the workers was not limited to Moscow. In early March in Petrograd, the sailors of the Kronstadt revolted. These sailors had been at the very heart of the earlier revolutions, and their revolt was far more impactful than any other strike or march that would take place in other parts of the country. Similar to the workers in Moscow, the sailors demanded less power for the communists and the removal of all the bans on opposition meetings. They wanted the old parties like the left SRs and the anarchists to be able to once again openly form and meet. In essence, they were rejecting the dictatorship of the Communist Party. They believed that this dictatorship had perverted the ideals of the original revolution, pointing to the party's privileges as a key example of this n perversion. These protests would prompt Lenin to support a ban on all party groupings outside of the Central Committee, a new policy that he would announce at the 10th Party Congress on March 8th. At the time, this was seen as a necessary step to curb the protests throughout Russia. It would also have drastic ramifications when Stalin used it as justification for, well, a lot of the horrible things that Stalin did. For the sailors in 1920, it meant that the Red Army would soon be moving in to crush their resistance. Fighting would begin on March 7th with an artillery duel between the sailors and the soldiers, and over the next week the Red Army made several assaults on the sailors' positions inside fortifications in Petrograd, assaults that were unsuccessful. Eventually the sailors ran low on supplies and munitions, and on the 18th they were defeated. While the sailor revolt was unsuccessful, it did prove to be just another sign that war communism and communist economic and political policy as it existed in early 1921 was not popular and may not have been workable at all. The solution, as proposed by Lenin and some of the other communist leaders, was the New Economic Policy, or NEP. The NEP represented, at its core, a bit of a reversion away from the communist ideal and towards a more traditional economic model. This was all prompted by the toxic relationship that had developed between the party and the peasants and workers. Lenin believed that this crisis caused by the toxicity required large changes, even if those changes represented a step away from the ideal communist future. The NEP included an almost complete abandonment of forced requisitions of all surplus goods in the countryside, the abolition of compulsory labor, and the reintroduction of private trade. Not only would this new trade be legal and encouraged, money would also be reintroduced into the economy to facilitate it. All of these activities would then be taxed by the state. This represented a move towards capitalism. The state would retain control of some of the larger industries, but many pieces of the economy would be functioning under something that looked a lot like Western capitalism. There was still some lip service paid towards instituting full economic communism at some ambiguous point in the future, but there was not any concrete information on how this would happen. The introduction of the NEP was an important turning point for the revolution. It represented the end of the idealistic period of revolutionary zeal and the resignation by the communist leaders that a worldwide revolution for which they had been but the vanguard might not happen. It would also separate the party into two groups, those who supported the NEP and saw it as a necessary evil, and those who had always believed that the better course would have been to force the peasants, workers, and anybody else who resisted into line by whatever means necessary. This split would play a critical role in the fracturing of the party after Lenin's death, with Trotsky and Stalin both taking very different views on the NEP, and that being a key point in their disagreements, which would eventually lead to Trotsky's exile and Stalin's rise to power. Now, while the NEP represented an important sea change within communist Russia from an economic perspective, it would also be introduced at a point where the relations between the communists and other countries around the world began to quickly change. 
During the revolutionary period and the early Civil War years, the concept of a worldwide revolution had been a key talking point of the communist leaders. To this end, the new Internationale had been held in Moscow on March 1919, with the goal of taking the communist principles and applying them to, at the very least, the rest of Europe. This represented the political side of the attempts to cause a worldwide revolution, and during the Polish-Soviet War, the military side of these attempts would take center stage. Both the political and military efforts to cause a world revolution would fail. And during 1920, the overall revolutionary zeal of the socialist groups around Europe greatly diminished, to the point of impotence, while at the same time the Red Army was defeated in Poland, and peace would be signed by the two countries in 1921. These defeats, both politically and militarily, caused Lenin and the other leaders to reset their goals for the revolution. No longer were they positioning themselves as the active vanguard of world revolution, but instead they would just be a communist island in a world sea of capitalism. On November 21, 1920, Lenin would state, quote, We are in the position of not having gained an international victory, which for us is the only sure way of victory, but of having won conditions enabling us to coexist with capitalist powers who are now compelled into commercial relationships with us. In the course of the struggle, we have won the right to an independent existence. This represented a change, just as important as the NEP did in the economic arena. In future years, even when the opportunity presented, it, presented itself, like it did in Germany in 1923, the Russian communists would be divided about the possibility of supporting any revolutions outside of their country. One of the many failed efforts by the communists to spread the revolution went in the direction that was far from Europe. It would be in the form of the First Congress of Peoples of the East, which would be held in Baku, uh, Azerbaijan, in early September 1920. Here, the Russian communists would attempt to work with the socialist groups from many other countries, with almost 2,000 delegates attending, representing 29 nationalities from all over Asia. Many of these representatives were from European colonies or protectorates at the time of the meeting, and so much of the conversations revolved around overthrowing the imperial invaders. Lenin would say that the main purpose of the Congress was to, quote, work out or to outline a practical starting point so that the work which hitherto has been conducting among hundreds of millions of people in the East in a disorganized manner should be conducted in an organized manner, unitedly and systematically. The Congress is interesting to discuss because it would put in stark relief many of the problems that would have to be solved by the Russian communists if they truly wanted to lead a world revolution. There were practical problems like language. With so many delegates, for, delegates from so many different peoples, the speeches had to be translated multiple times, which took a lot of time. Eventually, only three official translations were allowed, Russian, Turkish, and Persian, just so enough speeches could be made. The other challenges were far less concrete. Even though all of the groups present agreed on an anti-imperialist and mostly an anti-capitalist agenda, beyond that there was little that they could agree on. They all had different goals and different objectives that they wanted to achieve after the imperialists and capitalists had been destroyed. This made it impossible to work together in any meaningful way. Because, all of these, because of all of these problems, the first Congress of Peoples of the East would also prove to be the last. Part of the changes in the communist outlook in 1920 and beyond were based on the relations between communist Russia and other countries. The early 1920s would be a time of reconciliation between Russia and many of its former allies and enemies. Germany would be one of the areas where this reconciliation would happen in the immediate post-war period. Within Germany, there were basically two mindsets for the duration of the Paris Peace Conference, one that hoped to reconcile with the West and build better relations with the countries in Western Europe, and the other group believed that Germany should instead focus its efforts on building up relations with Soviet Russia in the East. This latter group would prove to be the correct path forward due to the contents of the Versailles Treaty, which made any reconciliation with the West a non-starter. The most important reason that the relationships with Russia would be prioritized was around the economy. The German and Russian economies were wrecked by the war, but they hoped that by reopening trade between the two countries, they could rebuild their economies both together. 
On the Soviet side, they were also looking to use a relationship with Germany to improve their situation and to also continue to influence Germany towards a proletarian revolution, which the communists hoped would, they would be in position to foster and support. For their part, the Red Army would strictly adhere to the policy of respect for the German borders during the war with Poland, so as not to jeopardize relations between the two countries. After the war, momentum for a formal trade agreement actually declined, due to the belief in Germany that there was less threat of an improvement between relations between France and Russia. This lack of urgency would push the signing of the Treaty of Apollo into April 1922. This treaty would create an understanding between the two countries that would allow German trade and investment to be used to rebuild and improve the Russian economy. This would prove to be beneficial agreements for both sides, although it would never be as lucrative as the Germans hoped. Before their war, Russia had in imported half of all of its foreign import from Germany. In the early 20s, it would never bring it to more than a quarter of the goods. Russia would also import far less in total due to the size of its economy after the Civil War. And due to these two changes, less than 5% of Germany's total exports would go to Russia, far below what they had hoped to, to shoot for after the war. While discussions were still occurring between Russia and Germany, beginning in May 1920 there would also be trade talks between the Russians and the British. The British were in a delicate position, due to their relations with other countries like France who were far less supportive of improved relations with Russia, and the continued support by the British for the White Movement. Due to these complications, the British were very clear with Communist negotiators that they wanted a trade agreement, but it would not include full diplomatic recognition of the Communist Russian government. This seems like a relatively meaningless distinction, but it was very important to the British during early 1920. One of the problems when trying to come to an agreement between Russia and the British was the role of Tsarist debt. Before and during the war, the Tsars had racked up a very large number of loans from the British government and British banks, and the British wanted the communists to honor those debts, with the, which the communists would not do. The head of the Russian delegation, Leonid Krosin, would say, quote, The Soviet government regarded itself as absolved from all Tsarist debts due to the Allies' warlike acts of intervention and blockade. Or, as M. V. Glenny puts it in the Anglo-Soviet Trade Agreement, March 1921, Quote, Russia, devastated by war and intervention, refused to regard the reimbursement of foreign capitalists as, the, as a first charge on her shattered economy. On the contrary, she felt entitled to present the Allies with a massive bill of indemnity for the vast losses of life and property sustained as a result of Allied intervention during the Civil War. End quote. The matter of debts would stall negotiations for several months. Eventually, the only option was to push the topic to a later date, with just a small piece of the debt to be repaid up front, but then any further conversations about it pushed to future negotiations. This version of the treaty would never be signed, due to the outbreak of the Polish-Soviet War. Once the conflict started, the British backed away from the table for some time due to concerns about views of other countries. It would only be after the fighting ended and news of the improving relations between Germany and Russia reached London that the British once again started pushing for the negotiations. Concern about Germany gaining a status of preferred trade partner was acute enough that the British even took the step of removing all discussions about the debts in an effort to get the treaty signed as quickly as possible. The normalization of relations with the West, represented in various trade agreements, would be an important step to bringing Russia out of the period of the Civil War. Combined with the defeat of the white forces on the battlefield and the suppression of the green forces in the countryside, it would signify the end of the period of uncertainty which began in Russia during the revolutions and then ran through the entire period of Civil War. But what precisely was the date on which the Russian Civil War ended? Well, as with most really good questions, the answer depends. The number one question you have to answer before being able to say precisely when the Civil War ended is what constitutes a civil war. Was it the presence of formal white opposition? If so, the Civil War could have ended as early as, as November 1920 with the defeat of Wrangel. Was it the signing of peace treaties with Russia's external enemies? If so, it could have been on March 1921, after the signing of peace treaties with Poland. Was it based on, not on military, but economic factors? 
that might point to the March 21st date of, uh, of the end of war communism, which was replaced by the new economic plan. Does a civil war only end when there is actual peace in a country? In that case, the time frame greatly expanded. There was active resistance by peasants and partisans throughout the early 1920s, with it not ending in eastern Siberia until June 1923, or in other outer territories like Georgia and Central Asia until well into the mid-1920s. As you can see, there are many answers to the question of when the Russian Civil War ended. I think you could even make a convincing argument that the end date should not be based on military actions, or economic regulations, or internal disturbances, Maybe instead it should be based on internal events, in which case you might need to look to the official declaration of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1922, or maybe Lenin's death in January 1924. I don't really think that there's a perfect answer here. I'm, I'm not going to provide one, which I know might be unsatisfactory. All the dates above could be considered, and an argument could be made for either one. And really, the answer to the question doesn't matter. Regardless of specifically when or why the Civil War ended, the suffering of the Russian people during the Civil War period was on a scale that is simply staggering. Estimates vary greatly on the exact number of deaths caused by the Civil War. I've seen numbers as high as 10 million, with other estimates being around 7 million. One of the greatest killers was not military action or violence, but instead the famine, with the famines of 1921 and 1923 being absolutely crippling to the Russian people. During those years, there were periods of bad weather which caused several crops around Russia to fail. When this was combined with both requisition and general disorder due to the Civil War, the results were catastrophic. It's hard to know precisely how many deaths the famines around Russia caused, but it's probably over half the total number of deaths from the period of the Civil War, which again could be as high as 10 million. The one question that remains to be answered bef before we end here is why did the Bolsheviks, later the Communists, win the Civil War? Given the fate of the February Revolution and the Provisional Government, the eventual victory of the Communists was never assured, and early on I'm not even sure it was really likely. Over time they were able to assert their control, entire books could be written to try and answer the question of how they did that, entire books have been written about it. But I will give you just three reasons that I think are among the most important for why the Bolsheviks, later communists, won the Civil War. The first is that from the very beginning, the Bolsheviks were very clear that they wanted to bring Russia out of the World War. This provided them with a base of support from a large number of Russians who had not found a group to represent them on the topic. Remember, the provisional government was still all in on winning the war on the side of the Allies. The second reason is that the Bolsheviks found their support in just the right places. Unlike the SRs or the Mensheviks who had led the provisional government and had found their greatest support in the countryside, the Bolshevik support was concentrated in the city, and this made it easier to control, direct, and organize. It also provided them with much more potent geographical positioning once the Civil War got moving in earnest. It provided them with just more people during the Civil War period. The third reason is that while the Bolshevik leaders were idealists, especially when it came to communism as an ideal, they were not afraid to move away from those ideals when the situation demanded it. This adaptation is a theme that's been running throughout the entirety of these episodes, from the introduction of war communism to its eventual removal due to the implementation problems, to the ban on factions and the brutal violent suppression of any individuals who spoke out against the actions of the party. It also meant smaller things that we barely touched on, like corruption and favoritism within the party, which caused a few problems, but also meant that the communist leaders had a base of support within the party itself. This third reason set the communists apart from the provisional government, or many other revolutionaries of this period. The socialists in the provisional government had been far too idealistic, too concerned with failing, to take some of the drastic steps that were required to stay in power, a concern that the Bolsheviks had been able to take advantage of when they first rose to power in 1917. When they were then in power, Lenin and the other leaders would not let hesitancy or idealism get in the way of staying in power longer. It should be said, though, that while this drive and ability to adapt allowed the communists to win the Civil War, it also irrevocably altered the makeup and trajectory of communism in Russia. By the end of the Civil War, 
whenever you think that was, communism in Russia bore little resemblance to the ideals of 1917. Instead, they had been altered and mutilated so that the communists could assure victory in the civil war. That is all that mattered. It would be those same alterations that would not just allow, but in many ways facilitate the rise of one of the most brutal and violent dictatorships in history, under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we begin a series on an event that I have referenced several times in the last few episodes, the Polish-Soviet War. I'm